behalf of um, Professor Rula Abisab, the Director of the Institute of Islamic Studies. Um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, our lecture this afternoon, which will be given by our very distinguished guest, Professor Sarkar Bashir Dian from Columbia University. Uh, professor Yang is a uh, professor of French and philosophy at Columbia who uh, received his academic training in France. He's an alumnus of the École Normale Supérieure in the Normalia, and as well as the Sorbonne. Um, and Professor Yang has, uh, has taught uh, not only at Columbia, but before that at um, um, at Northwestern North uh, University and then uh, before that at uh, the uh, University of Dakar in uh, Senegal. Um, his work uh, is tremendously wide-ranging, I mean, really uh, astonishingly wide-ranging. He started his philosophical uh, uh, training and his philosophical interests originally um, uh, focused on logic, mathematical logic, Boolean logic, algebra, um, and that is what his uh, dissertatural dissertation, his first book, uh, was about. But then um, his uh, more recent work has expanded um, to include um, works on, uh, on African philosophy uh, and the philosophy of Muhammad uh, Iqbal. And uh, most recently, um, a, a very important and interesting work called uh, Philosophy on Islam, um, as well as most recently a, a book entitled Bergson Postcolonial, in which he, um, as it were, triangulates uh, Bergson, Leopold Seda Senghor, and uh, Iqbal in an extremely productive uh, discussion and exchange. So without uh, any further delay, I'd like to turn the floor over to our distinguished guest, uh, who will speak uh, on the topic of the Word of God and its languages. Thank you for this introduction and thank you all for, for coming. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I would like to thank the Institute. This is quite an honor uh, for me. Thank, thank you, this director, my good friend, Professor Kuzowski, Kuzowski and uh, Professor Gaff Green. And thank to everybody who made my, my visit possible. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the, actually, the picture of mine that you have in that poster is a little younger <laughs> than me. Less gray hair. This was uh, a way of luring you here, <laughs> making myself more attractive. <laughs> so, um, in what sense is sacred scripture said to be the word of God? That is a question which is posed in all three religions of the book. To use here the Islamic phrase that is used generally for uh, uh, Jews and, and Christians, and which applies, of course, so well to uh, Muslims themselves. Such a theological question, a philosophical question, in the title of Spinoza's chapter 12 in his Tractatus Theological Politicus, in which he writes this. They who hold the Bible as it is to be the handwriting of God, sent from heaven to man. We, we doubtless exclaim that I am guilty of the sin against the Holy Ghost concluding that it is in parts imperfect, corrupt, erroneous, and inconsistent with itself. It is Spinoza. Scripture also is sacred and its doctrines are divine, so long only as it moves mankind to piety towards God. But if it comes to be almost entirely neglected, as it was at one time by the Jews, it is nothing more than ink and paper. It may then indeed be profane and obnoxious to corruption. And if under such circumstances it is corrupted or perishes, it is a false phrase to say that it is the word of God which is corrupted 
or patience. In the neglect of its precepts, it has ceased to these men to be the word of God, even as in the time of Jeremiah, it was incorrect to say that the building which perished in the flames was the temple of the Lord. I wanted this to be my point of departure. And as you can see here, the theological problem that Spinoza is addressing is this one. How could Moses, even in the height of his anger, just destroy the word of God? Just throw the tables in anger at the spectacle of the impiety of his people and destroy the word of God that was imprinted on the tables that he had received. That is the question addressed by Spinoza here. And to that important theological question, he answers, because it was not the living word of God anymore, but just petrified uh, 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 tables, petrified inscriptions on corruptible tables of stone. And here I'm, of course, playing on the word petrified, because as you all know, the etymology is about petrus, uh, uh, stone. The word of God uh, is uh, uh, truly what is received by mothers if it is beating in the hearts of human beings and expressed in their ethical behavior. When it is living and lived by being incorporated so that it translates into piety. When it is manifested by piety, it is truly the handwriting of God in the heart of the believer. And when it is not incorporated, then like everything sensible, it is generated and therefore obnoxious to corruption, just like the temple of the Lord deserted by true believers is the simple, perishable building, the tables of a law not respected are simple pieces of stone. In fact, let me stop here and, and tell a, a story that would have been that was not, which I, I regret. I was hoping, when you remember this pastor from Gainesville, who just held the whole world on, uh, you know, keep everybody on their on edge because he was threatening to burn a few crumbs. I was thinking, why if, uh, instead of just reacting and displaying anger on televisions, etc., people had decided to say, go ahead. After all, what you are going to burn are just cardboards, ink, and paper. And then put in front of his church a few hafiz of Quran who would be reciting the Quran, making it sure that it is written in their own heart and in their memory. And then after he has burned his, I don't know, 20 or 25 Quran, say, why would you proceed in burning these guys? Because actually they are walking Qurans. This would be the sense of what Spinoza is saying here. The word of God is written in the heart of the believers. And the three Abrahamic faiths are built upon this belief in a revelation from the one God uh, that is incorporated and embodied. There is, for example, a well-known Islamic tradition uh, uh, where speaking in the first person, God declares, neither my heaven nor my earth can contain me, but the heart of my servant, the true believer, can. Strictly speaking, the word of God can only descend into what is of the same nature, namely the heart of the believer, or according to philosophers, the human intellect or pure prophetic faculty. Here we have a parallel between the general usual idea of a heart, which is also uh, uh, the faculty receiving the word of God in the mystical, more mystical Sufi tradition, and what philosophers, the equivalent of that, when philosophers, Aristotelian philosophers in particular, consider it to be uh, uh, the active intellect or pure prophetic faculty. From the realm of the intelligible and the divine, it enters the sensible when it is, when its uncreatedness is translated into our created words and its eternity, so to say, uh, uh, into is translated into our temporality. The Islamic religion is founded upon the narrative of the descent at zero, at once of the book into the prophet's heart, although he was illiterate. That is to be understood as the fact that his, he was a blank uh, 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 slate upon which God could write with his own hand. 
then it will take the message he received 23 human years to unfold fragment after fragment, verse after verse, literally out of the prophet's body. And you know that certain uh, traditions uh, tell us that sometimes it would be painful. It would be like giving birth. And it kind of came out of his uh, uh, body, expressing this idea of a true embodiment. From the first Quranic verse commanding to read or recite to the last one proclaiming that God is oft returning, understood, returning towards the one who asked for his mercy. So what first happened in one single fiat, in a moment out of time, took 23 years to be translated into the sounds and letters and words bound together into what we know as the Quran thus transforming the pursing of eternity, something that happened at once, into duration. And the Quran is, in essence, spoken uh, uh, word uh, for, that, for that reason. And that explains the resistance of the first generations of Muslims to actually transforming it into a book. This is what is known in the philosophical jargon as in liberation of, of the book. And you know that one uh, uh, example, one, probably the best illustration of that resistance was the first caliph of Islam himself, Abu Bakr, who, uh, when he was, uh, uh, when the second caliph, the one who was going to be the second caliph, Umar, came to see him and said, why don't we put the word of God into uh, the form of a book? Because people who know it by heart are dying. Uh, uh, he just ran away and said, if anybody else had proposed that, I would have punished him. So this res uh, resistance to the becoming book of the Quran comes from the very fact that, as I have insisted following Spinoza, it has to be written in something which is of the same nature as itself, that is to say, the heart of the prophetic faculty of the human being. Now, to come back to Spinoza, it must be noted that an understood premise of his statement about the word ceasing to be God's word is that its meaning for him can be separated from its expression. In other words, the whole uh, uh, point made here by Spinoza is premised upon the fact that you have on the one hand the expression of the word of God, which could become petrified if the meaning is stripped out of it. As I say, this idea of the embodiment of the Quran is shared by the three Abrahamic religions, but in, on this particular point of the possible disconnect between the expression and the meaning, is such a disconnect consistent with the Islamic notion of what it means for the scripture to be the word of God is now the question I'm going to pose. For Muslims, revelation is not about a divinely inspired account of events, visions, etc. But as said in a powerful classical African novel, they are words of God as God pronounced them. This is uh, some kind of specific difference among the Abrahamic traditions of uh, Islam. The novel in question that I'm alluding to is by Senegalese writer, Sheikh Hamidou Khan, and is entitled The Ambiguous Adventure. I hope everybody has read it. <laughs> Who has? You should, before I leave, I'll come back before I leave and make sure that. <laughs> the very first pages of the novel present the reader with an hallucinating scene of cruel punishment inflicted upon a student by the master of a Quranic school because the child just mispronounced a verse, a word in a verse. I quote the master. Be accurate in repeating the Lord of your Lord. The master orders while pinching the child's ear till it bleeds again. He has done you the gracious favor of bringing his own speech down to you. These words have been veritably pronounced by the master of the world. And you, miserable lump of earthly mold that you are, when you have the honor of repeating them after him, you go so far as to profane them by your 
carelessness. You deserve to have your tongue cut a thousand times. These are the very first words of the novel. This scene is just uh, uh, amazing. We are struck then to discover after this first passage that Sambajal, that is the name of the child in the novel, is submitted to such a treatment precisely because the master who considers him his best student loves him. Never be in love, by the way. <laughs> and Samba himself knows that, uh, that love and is the first to blame himself as unworthy of the love that the recitation of the Quran is about. This sentence, the text say, and now we have the, uh, the reaction of somebody else. This sentence, which he did not understand, for which he was suffering martyrdom, he loved for its mystery and its somber beauty. It was a word come from God. It was a miracle. It was as God himself had uttered it. Whoever defaces it deserves to die. I wanted to cite that powerful opening of this classic of African Francophone literature as being a fictional dramatization of a philosophical and theological question which was posed in Islam concerning what it means for a text to be spoken by God. In other words, to have been vertically translated from the infinite and eternal into the finite and temporal receptacle of a human language. And that question leads naturally to that of the sacred language, which is then the one in which God spoke. Is that sacredness an exclusive essential attribute of the language that has just thus been elected? Or did that election, in other words, did that election create the sacredness of the language? Or did it just manifest what was already its nature? In other words, if God spoke Arabic, or Hebrew, is that because Arabic or Hebrew were eternally sacred, distinguished, or did God just decide, I'm going to speak any banal human language, and by speaking it, I'm going to make it sacred. The, I have called the descent of God's word into a human language a vertical translation, because what I want to examine is its connection with what I then call the horizontal translations in the plural of the word into other human languages that do not share in the same sacredness. Or do they? Did Latin become somewhat sacred when it received the word through horizontal translation from uh, 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 Greek, Aramaic, uh, etc.? That seems to be the case for those who are deeply attached to it as the liturgical language of Christianity. Given that vertical translation divides human languages into those that are sacred and chosen and those that are not, is horizontal translation permitted and simply possible? These are the questions I want to pose here. First, looking at the theology of vertical translation from the infinite to the finite, then at the theological political implications of horizontal translation from the sacred language to the uh, profane ones. So one we point the theological question of divine uh, translation. As I've said, behind the fictional scene of Samba Yalo, the child at Quranic school and his master, the notion of a word being as God himself has uttered it evokes the famous theological problem that was at the center of the period of inquisition that took place at one point during the reign of the Abbasid Caliph al Mamun, who reigned, as you know, from 1813 to 1833. Let's recall briefly that the problem which opposed rationalist theologians, the Mu'tazilites, who considered that the Quran was created, to the traditionalists who held that it was uncreated, was a particularly crucial consequence of another division on the question of the attributes of God. And I just found that, actually, that Professor Wisniewski's students have been dealing with this question of the created versus uncreated Quran very recently. So we did not plan on this. <laughs> it is just pre-established harmony. 
or the hand of God as you might call it as well. The question was, are the attributes of God real and therefore God himself, or are they simple names? And the question is not just raised apropos anthropomorphic attributes, because of course if you say the face of God or the hand of God, uh, etc., or even the back of God as in the Bible, these are attributes that clearly uh, are not God. But also, apparently, this concern apparently lost less problematic uh, attributes such as all-knowing, uh, all-powerful, or living. To be against the attributes mean that you do not want to have any multiplicity introduced in the essence of God. And for example, have knowledge be a real <coughs> attribute sharing in the, in the uh, eternity of the essence. In other words, if you say that God knows by his knowledge, you are creating some eternal attribute such as knowledge next to God. Next to God, this phrase doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, but what does it mean to say that God knows by his uh, essence if he is also living by his essence, etc.? So it is looks like it is an undecidable question. The question of the divine word uh, is a particular instance of that controversy which opposed attributists and anti-attributists. For example, verses speaking about the Quran being in the mother of the book, in the presence of God, or about it being on a preserved uh, 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 tablet, have been evoked to support the notion of an uncreated word eternally co-present with God. And uh, uh, here, uh, the uh, most uh, cited verse from the Quran would be the one in Surah to Zohruf, which says we have made it a Quran in Arabic that you may reason, and verily it is in the mother of the book, in our presence, high in dignity, full of uh, wisdom. The phrase mother of the book expresses here an important notion in this opposition between two views, one that says that God is not made, uh, uh, that the word of God is not made up of letters, nor is it a voice. I'm quoting here Ibn Kulab, uh, anti attributist. It is indivisible, it is impartible, it is indeceptible, it is unalterable, it is one thing in God. And <coughs> the other view, the opposing, uh, the opposing view is the one reported uh, by Sharastani to have been expressed by uh, Ibn Hanbal, the theologian Ibn Hanbal, and the leader of the Mazhab that bears his name, <coughs> and also the Hanbalis and the Salaf, uh, uh, in the following uh, terms. What is between the covers of the book is the word of God. And what we read and hear and write is the very word of God. It therefore follows that the words and letters are the very word of God. But inasmuch as agreement has established that the word of God is uncreated, it follows that the words and letters are eternal and uncreated. So you see that this theological, philosophical point here is actually what was being expressed in the fiction of the, the master talking to his student, Sambayya. Let's just remark, going back to the Quranic verse and reading the Quranic verse together with the second position, that the words and letters thus declared eternal and created are in Arabic there. So we, it seems that we are answering the question of the sacredness of the Arabic language in such a way that we would consider Arabic to be eternal, an eternal language next to the presence of God. And finally, you end up wanting to uh, uh, hold some form of skeptical or intermediate position, saying that just as uh, 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 Wolfson in his book on the Kalam uh, uh, said, I'm quoting him, in every created Quran by recitation, hearing, writing, is invoked the uncreated word of God. So that every created Quran consists of two natures, 
a created nature and an uncreated nature. As if, if I am reciting the Quran, actually my recitation obviously is created. The words I could tell that to, to recite, I don't know, Surah to Iqra would take three, five, four minutes. Okay, this is temporality, but at the same time, I'm also saying that when I recite it, present in my recitation is the eternal Surah Iqra that doesn't take any time at all. So I'm holding both positions uh, uh, here. As I say, this theological contro controversy became also political when the, when the uh, Abbasid Caliph al Mamun decided that he wanted some official theology, some official rationalist theology, and started uh, launching this inquisition, uh, of which the most uh, known uh, victim was Ahmad ibn Hanna, who was the most famous victim of that mihna, that uh, inquisition, uh, uh, before the death of Khalif al Mamun. And he came out of that, uh, as you know, a moral, a moral victor, because he, uh, uh, with great fortitude, he, hold, he held firmly in prison and in the torture his belief and his faith in the uncreatedness of the Quran. So, but being a moral victor doesn't mean that you are also theologically right. So the question actually remains, can we really think that the word of God as transcribed into the letters and words of the Quran can share God's eternity, was the question posed by the most rationalist theologians. Weren't the question and the disputation ultimately about words? After all, and this is the point I want to make about this controversy, it is in the very nature of our created word that when the eternal descends into it, it gets ipso facto translated into the created beings that letters and sounds are. To the alternative created versus uncreated could respond somehow the concept of translation. <coughs> Those who held the rationalist position were not ultimately saying anything different. Their position amounted to saying that the word of God translated itself into a word for the humans that they could hear, read, understand a word that was offered to their capacity to comprehend. In other words, one could hear, just look at the concept of translation as somehow, somehow, going beyond this frontal opposition between creation, created and uncreated. I would say, to take back my, to take again my example, that the eternal, uncreated chapter Iqra of the Quran would be then translated into the temporal created recitation of the same chapter by, uh, uh, by me. Maimonides was part of that debate about the word of God being translated into human language. Again, all these uh, uh, questions of the of theology in, in Islam were a, a larger philosophical uh, uh, question for those who wrote in uh, uh, philosophy at the time, and Maimonides being one of them. About that controversy, which he commented, uh, uh, he wrote in the chapter 26 of his guide for the perplex, the Talmudic maxim, that the Torah speaks in the language of man. Beyond serving as an explanation for certain clearly anthropomorphic attributes of God, it certainly also means that the word of God was created slash translated into the language of the children of Adam, as Maimonides says in his commentary. And in fact, uh, this is somehow the, the, the working of what it means for uh, the divine to enter the, the human world. The entry itself, the entrance itself, is what I'm calling here uh, 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 translation. And the untranslatable doesn't make any, any sense in that, in that uh, 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 if you look at it that way. Because if the Torah in the language of the children of Adam is written in the language of the children of Adam, 
the book is in the language for human beings. There is not such a thing as the language that would stay in the presence of God and then uh, uh, would be the uncreated eternal language that would be also in the, in, in the book. To give you a precise example on one single word, one could consider that what is the language that God speaks with himself? If he's just by himself, talking to himself, as we all do when we shave in our, in our mirror, we speak to ourselves. If we are shaving, we do something else. If, when God speaks to himself, how does he call himself? Well, maybe the, a word that would be, uh, 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 that could be used in that case would be samat. The word that you find in the Quran, the last word in the, in the Surah Ikhlas, where God calls himself samat. What is interesting with that word, you have one single occurrence of it in the Quran. The very word that translates the absolute absoluteness of God could only be there once. Now, we understand the word because we use it in different occurrences. Okay? A child would know that father, what father means, if father is used in a certain number of contexts where it is clear that to be the father of is to have a certain relationship to him and to his friends as well. What if a word is a total apex? appearing only once. There is no point of comparison, so we don't know actually what it means. You just try some kind of meaning, some kind of translation, which is the case for summer. If you look at translations of the Quran, you find many different <coughs> translations of summer. Probably absolute, the absolute, the absolute would be one uh, good translation. That would be the way in which God has a, a, a kind of nickname for himself when he speaks his <laughs> godly language to himself when he shapes. Now, when he speaks to us, obviously, he has to have all these beautiful names that are names for us. So all-knowing, all-powerful, all blah, 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 all these are not actually any kind of multiplicity because they are not for him, they are for us. This is God somehow giving himself to us and not talking to himself in his uh, uh, shaving uh, situation. Sorry for being so disrespectful <laughs> for the divine, but he allows that in certain circumstances. <laughs> now, turning to the language of the children of Adam, what are the implications for the linguistic receptacle of what I have called a vertical translation? What does it mean for a human language to be sacred and thus set apart from those that are not? To be precise, what does it imply that as the Quran itself declares that a revelation from the Lord of the words came down with the truthful spirit into your heart so that you may admonish in a clear Arabic language, the discerning Arabian movie. So the text declares that what descended into the heart came out in plain Arabic for people to receive. Interestingly, another Quranic verse makes reference to those who opposed Muhammad's claim of having received a revelation by accusing him of simply carrying the word of a mysterious secret teacher, and some traditions say that that secret teacher was a man named Rahman, and pretending that they were from Qah. An accusation to which then the Quran replies in, his, in its very self-referential way, on behalf of its prophet, that while the language of that hidden teacher is foreign, Ajami, the words uttered by Muhammad are clear Arabic. The same expression is used in the Salman Arabian Mubi. Two notions are here implied. First, that of the well-known inimitability of the Quran, in that utmost clarity and self-evidence, which is, according to Islamic tradition, the only true miracle claimed by his transmitter. Second, that of a difference and separation between Arabic and non-Arabic, Ajami. Depending on how they are understood, these two notions could either lead to the idea that it is because of its sacredness that the language has been eternally chosen to be the receptacle of the word of God, or to the understanding that the language is in fact made sacred by and after receiving the Depending on which side is taken on that issue, the question of what happens to the word of God through horizontal translation 
will be addressed differently. The dominant view, consistent with the theological doctrine expressed by the Master, of an uncreated Arabic Quran co-eternal with God, is that no paraphrase in any language can fully express its meaning. So if it is necessary to have it explained in the languages of the Muslims, and not all of them, actually the majority of them do not speak Arabic, it must be also understood that such a transfer of its meaning, the Tarjamat al mani cannot amount to a translation. The theological implications of the translation of the text from Arabic to the vernacular are such that Fran French translator, actually Jacques Berck, if you read French, I believe that the best translation of the Quran is Jacques Berck's uh, uh, translation. And he has compared himself this operation of translation to an adventure or even a violation. He called it a violation, a natanta. Translating uh, the Quran is a kind of natanta. Yet, and this is an important point I want to make, his own French rendition of the meanings of the Quran is a testimony to the fact that translation of scripture always operates assuming the understood premise that it is the reception of the word of God that renders a language sacred, and not its natural sacredness that calls for it being, for it being the receptacle of the word. It is a consequence of that premise upon which <coughs> translation operates, that translation into a vernacular somehow constitutes that vernacular as a new, and if not sacred, at least a liturgical language. The French language that Jacques Berck uses in his rendition of the Word of God can certainly be called a liturgical French, that is, a variety of French in which the Quranic Arabic is present. And this is, uh, for those of you familiar with translation studies, this is a well-known question in translation study. Do you translate re uh, respecting so much the, the receiving language that your reader could think that the original work was in that language? Or do you translate in such a way that the language from which it is translated is still present in the receiving language? It is haunting you. You read the text and you cannot ignore that it is translated because your own language with which you are familiar is sort of unfamiliarized by the translation uh, itself. The ethics of translation, to use the phrase of Antoine Berman, is to create some form of equivalence between languages by, and I use the phrase uh, by Berman, putting them in touch. Translation in general reveals the receiving language to itself. It reveals to it its own nature and its potentialities, and in the case of divine meanings, its capacity to be a receptacle for the sacred. The putting in touch when it concerns the sacred and the vernacular has the effect of deeply transforming the latter and to recreate it somehow. That is why Martin Luther could declare that the German language, as it became a liturgical language, was his own unsurpassable creation. His letter on translation uh, 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 uses that language. He was not sim simply bragging against those he called the papist, or even worse words, who while condemning his German rendition of the Bible were using it. He was explaining, in fact, the very nature of translation of the sacred and the capacity of translation to transform and recreate the receiving language. I want to finish by considering the concrete example of Quranic translations in the languages of sub-Saharan Africa. But before that, well, let me skip that. <laughs> and go directly to what I want to say. Translations and commentaries of the Quran in sub-Saharan African languages are, are as Tal Tamari and Dimitri Bondarev state in their introduction to the volume of the Journal of Quranic Studies uh, uh, that they edited on that topic, both a widespread practice and one that is largely understudied and unnoticed. Yet that practice gives an excellent illustration of the becoming liturgical of languages receiving through translation the word of God. 
One important example studied by uh, Bondarev in particular is the language known as Tamjum. It was truly given birth by the putting in touch of the Arabic of the Quran and the old Kaluri language in northern uh, Nigeria. Uh, its very name from the Arabic tarjama, meaning translation, indicates that its sole raison d'etre was precisely to be a in-between languages, as I would call it, a way of speaking Arabic in the vernacular, in the old Kanuri, making it liturgical. In fact, it is a sacred language, it is at least 600 years old, used only by Islamic scholars for their recitations and commentaries of the Quran, and it is not understood by common speakers of the Kanuri language. And this is a particular case of the more general fact of what I have called the becoming liturgical of African languages through the translation of the Quran, or through dealing with divine realities, prophecy, etc. There is certainly a liturgical world Wolof is my own language, language widely spoken by Senegalese. There is certainly a liturgical Wolof used in the paraphrase, commentary, and translation of the Quran, which is not the Wolof language in general. And this leads me to a story about translation of the Quran in Wolof that I want to share before I conclude. Under the supervision of uh, Professor Eraj Rawan Pai, a prominent and renowned professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at Sheikh Hamtadiyob University in Dakar, a wall of translation of the Quran was completed. Now, there is this official institution in Saudi Arabia which helps with publishing translations of the Quran. Its task is to control and publish translation of the book into the many languages spoken in the very different and diverse Muslim societies. And one good reason for going to them, if you have a translation of the Quran, is that they are going to provide funding and make sure that your Quran is published under such conditions of funding that you could give them for free, actually. Uh, so uh, uh, wanting to make the Quran available at no cost was the reason why my compatriot and good friend, Professor Rawan Gob, went to that institution. And his team found itself confronted with all sorts of evasive responses and delays. Professor who knows very well what the thinking behind that evasiveness, because he, for many years, he was the one in charge of organizing the pilgrimage to Mecca. <coughs> so he knows very well uh, how those institutions function. And he told me two things. First, there is a general instinctive suspicion vis-a-vis -vis the very notion of translating the Quran into any foreign language. First, but such wariness is amplified in the case of African languages. There is this entrenched idea that our African languages, Rawan told me, have something inherently and irreparably pagan that would inevitably corrode the purity of the message. So the belief in the division between chosen language and foreign barbarian language which dictates the attitude in the face of translation implies that there are languages more appropriate than others in their very essence to receiving the word of God, or even to simply deal with divine realities, with prophecy, etc. Senegalese poet in the world of language, Selim Musaka, have confronted in his work the notion that speaking of divine realities or chanting the prophet of Islam in a language other than Arabic is not appropriate. He had thus written the following lines, and I don't resist the the impulse to read it first in Wolof that nobody here speaks <laughs> before translating it into English. You do. Malebu nak ninan Wolof bahu. Buya umal khiyami. Bab Arab tukare waham. Dana wak serin tuba. Mutak ab Arab wetam. Teru Wolof ak buk yaram ak wak yopayam. Lujok ngir Rasulullah. Batim basa khor. I wanted to read it in Wolof just to hear my own language, but also because I wanted you to pay attention to the fact that Wolof itself is so, uh, you have so many Arabic expressions in it. So you heard Rasulullah, uh, you heard uh, other Yom uh, Al-Qiyam, etc. Let me, and now I translate. Let me tell this to those who claim that Wolof is not suitable. 
on the day of judgment, when the Arab language comes bragging, I would ask Sidi Tuba. Sidi Tuba is one of Sufi Sheikh, uh, founder of uh, Blackwood, etc. I would ask Sidi Tuba what gives Arab its distinction. Versification in Warf, or in the noble language, or in any other, is the same. As a language rises for, uh, 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 as a language is set forth to praise the messenger of God, its essence achieves nobility. Literally, its hidden genius becomes salty. That is what I'm translating as its essence achieves nobility. So this figure of a coming together of languages on the day of judgment is quite interesting. Somehow, in his own way, with his own image of that saltiness, the Senegalese poet is saying the same thing Martin Luther said in his letter on translation. Namely, that translation has this distinctive function of instituting a language, recreating it as liturgical. He holds that there is an absolute equivalence of all human languages. None has been chosen over the others for some distinctive intrinsic attribute. It remains a language among others. At the same time, the book has instituted Arabic as sacred. Uh, and that is why he calls Arabic the noble language. But any language that is touched by the message or the messenger through translation sees its essence achieve nobility and sacredness. It is as if translation reveals to the receiving tongue its own sacredness or nobility. Arabic is the language of the Quran for all Muslims. There is not such a thing as a language of Islam. Or rather, all languages are languages of Islam. If we had to pick up one to be the language of Islam, we would, of course, pick English, because it is prevailing in English that all things important are being published, even for this now, today. <laughs> that is ultimately the message of the scene between somebody else and his teacher. To love the words for themselves, to love their musicality, which is their meaning before their meaning, which belongs to no language in particular, that explains the liturgical value of the Quran in Arabic. That explains the love of somebody else for, for the word which he says, of which he says that it is the very architecture of the world and the world itself. And that explains why he says also that he loved these words that he did not understand for their sombre beauty. And that is the reason why he does his utmost to pronounce them just as God himself pronounced them. Thank you for your patience.
particular whether the um, uh, the uh, language giver um, is divine or human. Um, is that would that be part of your discussion? That would be of, the, of course something I would be very much interested uh, in as, as as well because uh, as you can as you can see my my, my line of thought these days is around translation right. and, and that notion of the Noah gave the, the one who gave uh, uh, language obviously is very much connected to that I would connect it to what I uh, try to do with the, the concept of prophet faculty what does the prophet do uh, and uh, the fact that our I mentioned the prophetic faculty. Uh, let's say Ibn Sina. I understand that you have it also in your class. You can see about Ibn Sina, Abyssinia. So Abyssinia, his account of the of the mirage. Although there is discussion to know if that particular text should be attributed to Abyssinia or not, but it is Abyssinian enough, and that is enough. Uh, he, he mentioned that when he went through the mirage, when uh, the point when the, the prophet reached Sidratul Muntaha and, and, and had his encounter with God. This is the pure reception of all the intelligent. Your, your intellect and your heart, your own being, his own prophetic being was open to whatever he was receiving then through the divine realities. Except that he has to come back for us. Uh, and that is the whole point. Coming back for us means that you need a language to talk to us. If the goal of a mystic is to get there and contemplate the divine realities, then language is not necessary. So the creation of language itself has to do with the way in which our prophetic faculty is able to transform into the sensible, the intelligible. And the origin of language becomes then translation itself. It is the, the, the origin of language is the way in which the intelligible divine realities translate in themselves into the sensible temporal uh, reality of man. And this is what the prophet does. We are all, we are all uh, endowed with this prophetic faculty. That is what makes us human. And that is what makes prophets only humans. The, the, the Quran, Islam insists very much on the simple humanity of the prophets, meaning that they don't have any kind of faculty that would make them other than human. But their faculties in them reaches a point of intensity, of course, that it doesn't have with us. And that the, the most important faculty is the faculty of translation. How do you translate the divine realities into sensible symbols and languages? Because, again, as Maimonides say, the Torah speaks in the language of the children. You have to take care of the children uh, of other Muslims. I still come back to the remark you made about this uh, gentleman thinking that actually God spoke English in the, in the gospel. This is a testimony to a good translation. You are so used to a translation that you end up thinking that it was the original language. This is interesting with Latin. Latin, people are attached to Latin as the liturgical language. And Latin was just a translation. But in fact, there are uh, some important things that happen in the la language of Latin as if it was the language of God. Uh, uh, you, probably many of you know this anagram, this Christian anagram about the question posed by Pontius Pilatus, what is truth, when he asked Jesus uh, what is truth. In Latin, it is quid est veritas. And there is this anagram. People say, well, Jesus did not respond. He didn't say anything. He just left. And they say the reason why he did not respond is that actually the response to Pontius Pilatus was already in the question quid est veritas. Because anagrammatically, quid est veritas could be turned totally into uh, 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 real quid adest. 
the man who is standing here. So when Pontius Pilatus asked what is truth, in fact, in his, res in his question was the response, the man, Jesus, who is standing here. Now, this would be some kind of divine revelation if the text was originally in Latin, because it doesn't work in the original Greek. <laughs> but it is as if, actually, the text was in Latin, and Latin is just a translation. This would be a good illustration of what I call the becoming liturgical or sacred of a language through translation. Uh, thank you so much for this Were any, were any of my Sufism students who might be hiding uh, behind there. Uh, I also want to thank you for prefiguring um, uh, my class on, on the names of, of God because uh, you know, you've, you've spoken about the referentiality of, of, of the names and we're going to talk about the particular Navi's uh, conception of, uh, of the names. You know, he, he always uh, does this, uh, uh, talks about the Thank you. For, for, for the names, it is, it, is, um, it is that. I mean, when if you, if you say this was a response that one could have against this rationalist conception of God, if you insist on the Tawhid, on the oneness of God, you do not want to introduce any kind of multiplicity in God. And the attributes are just destroying that multiplicity. And if I say God is calling, is living, is hearing, is seeing, etc., I'm uh, uh, multiplying uh, uh, things because I could say he is the one who punishes and he is the one who is merciful. It is as if I'm sort of introducing some contradiction in the essence. But at the same time, he is the one who says in the Quran, the old Asma al Husna, he has to him are the most beautiful names and he names himself. So, uh, one way of, of looking at, at, at this actually is to say names are the way in which, again, following the line of. of uh, what he said, are the ways in which he gives himself to us. The names are for us to call him by. And, and then uh, he, bec he could become then a personal God. Because with uh, 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 an essence enclosed in its own unity, there is no possible relationship. But if he calls himself the merciful, or the one who cures, or the one who is tawbah, Turn towards, uh, uh, etc. Then these names are names for us. You should even write them with a, a hyphen. Let's look at this uh, uh, traditional uh, Islamic view of the famous 100 name. This idea that God has 99 names and the the, Asmar, uh, the, the, the greatest name of God is the 100, and then. The, Everybody is looking for the 100th name to have the power of knowing exactly the 100th name, which is the 100th is one of the 99. If I am sick, really sick, of course the greatest name of God is the one who can. If I feel that I am the worst being on earth because my, my sins are so uh, big that I'm just lost, the merciful would be the greatest name for, for me. So all these names are for me. 
there is no such a thing as a greatest name in itself, which is always the greatest name for the for the for the for the human for the human being. And that is a very important aspect of, of God. His whole retreat in Samad and the way in which he gives himself in his name, and which you find. Iqbal, since we have spoken about Iqbal, thus opposes two verses, two chapters in the Quran, well, two sets of verses in the Quran. The one in the class where you find Samad, which is a definition in, by which God retreats from the word. He says, everything he is not. I am one, my oneness, I am Samad, my absoluteness, and I don't produce, and nothing produced me, so there is nothing you can tell. This is God shaving. And then, all the things in which God gives himself, in particular, under the name Nur. Nur is the most visible name, because Nur is the very condition of the light, is the very condition of, 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 of visibility. It is as if, from the retreat, he now comes to visibility and calls himself Nur. Multiplying in calling himself Nur, all the very sensible examples, I mean, as if he was sort of, you know, making up for, for solitary ikhlas by multiplying sensible examples to, 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 to give himself to us. Allah, nuru samawati wa laadu, mathari nuru ka mishkaatin fiha misbah, al misbah fi zujjaja, al zujjaja, etc. All these repetition and enumeration of, of many different sensible things like the lamp, the nature, oil, comparing himself to many different things in that verse. I'm reciting. I should not recite it because if I recite it normally, all mystical people are going to go, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't want that to happen, we have to control things, not speak to our heart, but our active intellect. <laughs> so, uh, uh, speaking of heart and active intellect, that would be the, the, the two faces of the same thing. If you say that the highest faculty in us is the heart, uh, um, speaking the language of Many, Ghazali, for example, say that it is the heart. And that the, the highest faculty in, his, in us would be the heart because it is the faculty beyond the senses and beyond reason, because we know through what we receive the testimony of our senses and we know also through our reason. And the faculty that would be beyond those could be the heart. Or sometimes we find it also uh, the eye. Eye that opens itself to the invisible, etc. It is more a philosophical thing to say that the highest faculty in us is the intellect, because they follow the language of Greek philosophy that they received, and they would say, uh, following the traditional uh, hierarchy of faculties that you find in Greek philosophy, Plato and Aristotle and Neoplatonism, that beyond the senses, beyond the, the faculty of, of, of knowledge, then you have this prophetic faculty that opens itself to the the intelligible word. But structurally, it functions just the way the heart functions. So on the, on the mystical side, so to say, you would say that the highest faculty is the heart, which receives directly the light from God. And on the philosophical, more philosophical side, you would say it is the active intellect which opens itself to these intelligible realities. So and someone like Avicenna, for example, who has uh, both approaches, the philosophical and also toward the end of his life, the more mystical language would actually go from one type of language to the, to the other. So, yeah. Uh, I had a question about you. So you began by referring to Spinoza. Of course, Spinoza, you know, in the tractatus, as you said, I recall, the importance of philology, political philology, uh, as a political generation. Okay, it's important, it's important for, for the secularism of the Dutch city state. Right. Uh, does, does any of you know, this, this of your central thesis on the translatability of you know, the translatedness of the word actually have political, theological political implications of that sort? Because you, you began by referring to Spinoza, who, you know, as we know, uh, is invested politically as a cause. And then you, you didn't return to yeah. politics in any sense. And in yeah. a sense, you know, I mean, it strikes me also just in a kind of way. To this, that there's a kind of contrast, isn't there, across Islamic civilization, you know, let's say pre 19th century Islamic civilization, uh, between the untranslatability of God's word on the one hand and the infinite translatability of the prophet's words, right, where nothing is lost in translation when it comes to the right? right? And I was 
looking at Malay, I was looking at other conference forms in the Malay language. And there's no sense that anything is ever lost in Malay or in any of the South Asia languages, for example. So uh, that there seems to be that kind of you're, you're absolutely right. I could have come back to, to Spinoza uh, on the politics of translation because uh, obviously the example I gave uh, quickly enough of my compatriot and friend Rawat and his translation in Wolof uh, has to do with that notion of controlling the meaning. Controlling the translation is controlling the meaning, making sure that actually the way in which things are translated are under control. One reason for the anxiety of, uh, of this uh, the Saudi Arabian institution that I mentioned is that they, that kind of translation they could not control. Because, of course, if you are, uh, I mean, you can have a Salafi translation of the Quran that would be slightly different from the non Salafi translation of the Quran. It is still a translation. You are still conveying the, 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 the mana if, if translation is about just taking the mana and putting it in the, some kind of linguistic. Uh, expression. So yes, indeed, in just like in the Tractatus of Theological Politicals, uh, politi uh, uh, words have political significance. The choice of word is something highly uh, uh, political. It is not just that censorship is implied, it is that every single translation is a reading. The notion that the, in, the interpretations could be multiplied is actually one of the political implications of this, which is actually the fact that an open living text, by its very definition, is always generating new, uh, new readings in that, in, in that sense. And uh, um, absolutely, thank you for calling my attention. Um, Thinking about the three Abrahamic religions that I would like to invite us, Christianity doesn't have this manifest this question in the same way that Judaism and Islam does, because the Christian Bible is initially in two languages, right? So Joyce reminds us Greek, Jew, Jew Greek is Greek, Greek Jew. Um, but where there's a very precise theological analogy to these debates is obviously in the debates over the nature of Christ which are also debates over the manifestation of the divine word and is it of uh, multiple essences or single essences? And is it parallel or together? So I, I, in listening to I was interested in the fact that for one Abrahamic religion, that the question of how the divine can become infinite is, is thought about around a particular historical event, the coming of the Messiah. Whereas for Islam, it's thought about in terms of the most every day of ritual practices, the reading of the Quran. Um, that's like an extraordinary different sense of history. Of history right? yeah, absolutely, and your, your sense is absolutely right. Actually, in the debate between the Mu'tazila and the Ashari on, on, the, on this question, uh, on the creativeness, it, that was an aspect of actually the controversy, saying that those who considered the and created Quran, co-eternal with God, were akin to the Christians who would consider Christ as this uh, co-eternal with God. So it became an accusation. So they were very aware of this uh, possibility of making the parallel if you consider that incarnation of the divine in Christ would be comparable to this uh, in liberation uh, of the word. Thank you for your lecture. I wanted to uh, kind of uh, revisit the question of translatability and the idea that um, basically by this means you have to make the sacred text understandable and translatable. And if the worshiper doesn't engage with that, the pietistic um, experience will not happen. But I, I thought we could also think about how powerful untranslatability is. In a way, they, I mean, even if you look at, at the Arab children 
who recite things they don't understand in their local colloquial languages. And yet there is a way in which untranslatability is very a very powerful pietistic experience in itself. Uh, rather than trying to render uh, the verses known or translated in a probably similar to the way poetry works. Uh, sometimes poets would tell you that they wrote something they at, at the beginning they didn't understand what they wrote actually. They knew it was just powerful and beautiful. They did not understand it. But that was part of the experience of the thing. I totally agree. This is what I tried to say probably too quickly when I came back at the end of presentation to the novel and to the experience of the child. And the child says that these words for which he was suffering martyrdom that he did not understood, understand, he loved them for their somber beauty. In other words, it is not that he loved them in spite of not understanding them. He loved them through the fact that he did not understand them which is the pietistic experience, let me say. The very musicality of, of the text he was reading and reciting under the guidance of his master. And this is the experience that Muslims do. I mean, I, uh, reading the Quran, his translation, is very hard. I don't think that anybody actually does that, who haven't had the experience of the text, who would start by the, the book of the Quran and say, OK, I'm going to see now what is the book of the Muslims what they are reading. It, it becomes very difficult because you open a, a chapter, it says the cow. You say, okay, this chapter is going to tell me about a cow. No cow. <laughs> it starts with something totally different. It jumps from this to that. And at one point, yes, you have a few verses talking about the cow, and then it goes talking about something else. It is, I'm not saying unreadable, but close to that, if it is in translation. But the pietistic experience of the Muslims who read the Quran, who recite it, is precisely that of a profound unity. If you read it in translation, you have uh, the impression of something which is just made of you know, bits and pieces, and, 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 and you don't feel the unity. When you have the Arabic recitation of it, if you are familiar with the text, that is where you have this pietistic experience that the child has when he says that the word he was reciting without understanding it, he understood something fundamental about it. It is that it is the very architecture of the word, which is the, the sense of unity and this almost mystical experience of unity through the recitation of a text of which he understands almost no word. And that is absolutely absolutely the, 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 the case, which is why somehow in a very self-referential way, the Quran itself has to explain that it is not poetry. The reason why it explains that it is not poetry is that it functions like poetry. And that image of something poetic, because you, you, you recite the poetry and things fall in place because you have a sense of its own rhythmic organization, so to say. If I have a, a verse uh, if I must pronounce a verse, even if you don't know the poetry, you would feel it because the number of syllables would not be all right. So you would feel that something is missing. That is the kind of totality that you sense in this pietistic experience of the, of the, of the, of the Quran. And the Quran itself, is very, uh, in a very self-referential way, speaks about that also. When the type, this beautiful tradition that says that. Um, the experience, the pietistic experience of the Quran that Muslims have, by well, Muslims, Muslims who are lucky enough to find themselves in paradise, <laughs> would have with the Quran is when it is recited, when angels themselves recite it, and recite in particular the chapter Rahman, Surah Rahman. And then it says when they have this sense of bliss, the pietistic experience. Now the prophets are going to recite it. And then after them, the prophet Muhammad to whom he was revealed. And when they think that they have reached the height, God himself will recite Surah Rahman. So this insistence on 
recitation of the spoken word, their <coughs> meaning is obviously very important. Of course, because you have prescription, injunctions, explanations, stories, everything. <coughs> but the simple audition of it, which is also why the prophet himself one liked to hear it recited by his own companions while he would listen to them. Um, I'm still absorbing all the wonderful <laughs> lessons. Uh, I wanted to turn maybe to the, uh, the, uh, the last part of your talk. I'm from Sudan, so I think you probably going to expect the question. Uh, because it's a place where both the language and the religion uh, are separated, so to speak. So I, I wanted to ask uh, the question of um, uh, Senegal and the motivation behind uh, those uh, like the academic and children wants to translate uh, <coughs> the Quran into local languages. Uh, the question being, of course, there's always a comparison between a Sufi understanding of how you know, the Quran itself is received and how Arabic itself is received in a more segmented way, as opposed to the rise of Salafistic in Senegal of Malaysia. So I know it's a uh, not controversial question, but it's a large question. But I, 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 expecting an answer, but that was one we did to think about. If one of your colleagues from Colombia in fact asked that specific question, why Senegal like this as opposed to your, your country? They seem to be more, um, you know, said, much more amenable to this kind of relationship between uh, local languages, local culture, and, and Arabic. And Arabic is not privileged not only in linguistic integration, but in a place like Senegal. So I was wondering, you know, how do we begin to Sufi orientation, which of course most of the South Africa have come from the Sufi organizations, as opposed to a uh, uh, different uh, understanding uh, of uh, not only the religion, but, uh, but uh, the, the place of the Quran and Arabic language, uh, because it's such a complex part of the South Africa. You're right, I mean, it is, it is the big question. why I, I quoted uh, this, uh, this uh, Senegalese poet in this prosopopoeia of languages, as it could be called, uh, presenting themselves on the day of judgment, all of them being one, uh, all human, human languages. So trying to keep this balance between the notion that indeed there is the language of the Quran and this insistence that the, the master and his disciples, somebody else, have the fact that when you recite it, although you are reciting words, multiple words, multiple, and you are using multiple letters, and you are reciting it in time, it is still, still a reflection, and in your own recitation is contained this eternity, the eternity, uh, indivisible word of God that takes no time to be enunciated. In the same way that in that cave, Actually, when, when, when the angel Gabriel visited the prophet Muhammad, he did not just tell him about the six first verses of the club, uh, but actually the whole Quran somehow descended upon him, but then descended as something embodied, some, and he became a walking Quran, and circumstances are going to actually trigger the fact that the Quran would be coming out of him, which is also a way of saying he would receive Relation fragment after fragment. This kind of very Sufi understanding of that uh, embodiment is, is very present. And that is what explains the, 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 the force and the power of the academic language, not just the language as such, but even the, the, the letters themselves. I mean, the whole tradition in, 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 of calligraphy and, and of, of paying this much attention to the letters as they are. Sufis will tell you that, for example, when the, when the Muslim prays, what he does is write with his body the name Allah. Uh, 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 and so even the fact that God <coughs> is always referred to as Allah. I never do that. When I read the Quran in, in, in another language than Arabic, I do not like translation that keep Allah as Allah. Nobody says God. German God, when they say, uh, when they, so, so let's translate, but at the same time, you can understand this 
particular connection that people have with these names being in Arabic, which explains, by the way, why in many local languages, all the words to say God have disappeared. And they are all a variation of the Arabic word uh, allowed. So you do have that deep connection with the Arabic language. And at the same time, you have this radical linguistic nationalism expressed by Musa Khan, who doesn't want anything like the notion that there is a language that would be uh, Islamic, Islamic language uh, beyond or above other languages. So it is as if they were disconnecting the Quranic Arabic, which is the one in the uh, uh, Umul Kitab, or the local Mahfuz, from the Arabic being spoken by the Arabs. So you have this, uh, this duality, which is characteristic, I believe, of these uh, um, the cultures, the Muslim cultures in our areas. Uh, building off the point of Sub-Saharan Africa, I was wondering if you could talk to you uh, specifically about Senegal and the intersection, as you noted, of religion and uh, language but also with the junction of the French influence as well, albeit uh, the colonial manifestation of assimilation, how this interacts with the conception of language in the Senate Well, yeah, you, you do have uh, French present, and French has become, par uh, la force des choses, a Senegalese language uh, as well. Um, you, you did have, uh, historically, some, some tension between the two, because uh, French schooling was obviously something that was also against Arab school. So during colonial times, you had this distinction between the two, to the point when uh, uh, Louis Federer, who was probably the most influential French administrator during the colonial time of Senegal in the 19th century, decided to create what he called Medersa, using the Arabic word, where French could be taught but also Quranic school and Arabic school would be, would be taught. So today you have this politics of creating so-called uh, uh, Franco-Arab uh, uh, schools to try to reconcile the fact that uh, Quranic schooling is necessary along with uh, uh, studies in, in, in French. In French.
operation of translation actually is always present a third virtual language, a third language, which is what he calls the, the pure language. That you are not just translating from one language A to your own language B, but in doing that, you are somehow invoking and bringing to existence a language which is no particular human language, which is a language beyond all other languages. And you are having this mediation through the pure language. This experience of the pure language is almost a religious experience, uh, uh, although it happens in the very process of translation. So you would have here, uh, making a reference also to Benjamin, this notion of experiencing some transcendence in the act of translation without that transcendence being necessarily religious or above mind, God, um, uh, etc. But it is true that somehow uh, um, I believe that that experience of a high level of the language, which is not just conversation or even the literary use, is probably the best felt in the translation of certain works that have the power of revealing the language to itself somehow, that are such that they seem to be calling for some embodiment of that pure language, the language which is somehow the, the pre-Babel language, the Adamic language that we all spoke when we were all up there uh, 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 naked and you know, having all these fruits and so on and so forth before the, the apple or the strawberry and whatever fruit it was. So, uh, and before the curse of, of, of Babel. Uh, so it is as if through the operation of translation, we were really having this experience of a language before the multiplicity of languages. So that would be somehow something that we're translating into the terms that we are using for this experience of the transcendent of the language, the highest level of the language, uh, which doesn't necessarily have to do with probably translating the Bible or the Quran, etc. Uh, but yeah, and, and, and you are right. The, 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 when you read the, the Sermon on the Mount, in, in any language, you have the feeling that this goes beyond the capacity of your own language because of what is being said, the way in which what is being said call for, calls for some higher reality than the ones we are, we are used to. You're absolutely right by delineating the difference, the fundamental difference between an understanding of the word of God as inspiration by God. If the apostles wrote the gospel and wrote four different gospels and they were not gospels, it is understood in Christianity that they were all inspired by God, but at the same time it was an inspiration to write about the same the same story. And as I have shown using this fictional, this fiction of uh, 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 the novel to embody the fundamental belief of the 
Muslims that this is not inspired by God, but actually the actual word of God. That God himself spoke, as this, the master insists, is his student. Then the status of translation changes completely. It is as if in, in Christianity, the text had its very inception called for translation. And in fact, the fact that at one point, the apostles <coughs> spoke in tongues, the multiplication of tongues could be symbolically seen as the fact that this text from inside was open to translation. What I'm trying to say is actually consider uh, the Quranic text somehow in the same way. Seeing that translation is not just taking from a language to another language, but actually understanding that a given word is not a word of which you say it has been spoken once and for all. But that is, it is always speaking differently. In other words, you do not need to say, I am going to translate otherwise the Quran to make it more 250. Okay? You cannot <coughs> wrap it, you cannot hip hop it uh, 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 at all. But at the same time, you have to take into account the fact that it is impossible for you to read it like a person who was living in the 8th century could read it. The fiction according to which there is some unchanging word, because it is the word of God, it is not changing, doesn't make sense. Of course it is changing because we are changing. It is not changing, but we are changing. And if we come back to the discussion about names, saying that these names are for us, that the word of God is actually written in the language of the children of Adam. Meaning that the children of Adam are going to understand it one way, which is always who they are. There is a tradition, well-known tradition that you know as well, which says that one should read the Quran as, as if it was revealed to you at the moment when you are reading. In, in other words, your reading of it at this particular point is as if you were translating it into your own terms and at your own time. That is why the so-called literalism is a total fiction. People who say, well, let's agree by having a literal reading of the text. Anybody who, who, who actually is in the work of reading text, which is our case in the humanities, that's what we do. We read text, could understand that literalism is impossible. Any reading, the most literal reading, is already an interpretation. So installing ourselves in the idea that a reading is already a translation in the sense of, because tarjumat, as you know, means the two, translation or interpretation, is already an interpretation, is probably the only way in which we can give back to the word of God its living nature that uh, Spinoza was calling for, and not its petrified uh, nature, which makes it just a piece of, piece of stone. So you, you do not rewrite it, but you read it. And you read it at the time where you are. For example, the times in which we are living are probably going to emphasize verses, what I call verses of pluralism, in a way that it was not emphasized in ancient times. Because these verses that are emphasizing pluralism, and the fact that pluralism is not only natural, but is wanted by God, willed by God the way it is. When God says, if I wanted, I would have made you one single nation, I have one single belief, understood I did not want it, I made you totally different so that you understand each other, and he says, the only way in which you deal with difference is through your own deeds, compete in good deeds, knowing that it is only when you come back to me that I am going to explain to you the nature of the divergences. So there is no way in which I am going to make sure in this world that my own Sunni Maliki version of Islam is a good one. There is no reason for that. And so my divergence with someone who is not Maliki or who is not Sunni, etc., would be in saying we all have the same uh, uh, belief system anyway, fundamentally. And then when we go back to God, he is the one going to set it up. These kind of pluralistic verses in ancient times, you did not need probably to read them the way in which we read them. Now it is necessary for us to read them because we cannot live in a world 
where you would have someone fighting someone else just because they say they add to the court player that Ali is when you love. Everybody agrees that Ali is when you love. Why would we fight over, over that kind of, of things, etc.? And also how that pluralism is also extended to include any kind, and all religions, not just the religions of the Ahl al-Kitab, but any uh, uh, religion as well, or irreligion itself, because that is what our world is calling for. So we are not rewriting the book, we are reading it. In other words, the verses that are going to shed light on the totality of it are going to shift and change according to the times in which we are. And that reorganization of the meaning, saying that this verse sheds light on the totality, etc., is a way of reading the Quran in 2015, which is totally different from reading it in 720. So please join me in thanking what we have.